Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. All righty. Well, let's get started. Hallelujah. We're continuing our, li- our teaching on the life and teachings of Paul. Uh, Brother Paul is over in um, Corinth writing this letter to the church at Rome. And uh, we got through the first three chapters, I think. Last week we finished with got through chapter 3, um, and first chapter 1 dealt with, you know, of course, the original, his salutations and greetings and highs and how you doings and all that kind of stuff, and your uh, Eloise and uh, Kepasas and all that, got all that out of the way, and then he went into uh, talking about that, you know, the, the Gentiles were under sin, then he got, got to the Jews, I think, well, we're pretty cool, we, we got the natural covers, he showed that they were under sin, hallelujah, and that continues here. Um, uh, verse 30 of chapter 3 says, Do we make the, um, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, that's the Jew, by faith, and the uncircumcision by, uh, through faith, the uncircumcised, I mean the, the, the uh, Gentiles. Do we make, the faith, make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. In verse 1, chapter 4 is not just, you know, like a, he just, oh, a whole other, you know, letter, different thought. No. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Now, he says, notice, notice he said this, Abraham, our father, p- pertaining to the flesh. So he's talking to the Jews about the, the natural lineage of Abraham here, starting with. For if Abraham were justified by works. Now, here he is talking about, this is, this is one of the most complex subjects in the New Testament that shouldn't be that complex. We've made it difficult. Um, when he's talking about the works here, in reference to the law, he is talking about working out, making your salvation sure and steadfast because of the law and not because of faith in Jesus Christ. Paul goes on later on in this letter, we'll get to it, and says that the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now, some people think that because the word works is used, and they were justified by faith and not by works. That means that once we receive salvation by faith and not by works, then we know that we don't do anything. Now, nothing we do matters because that's works. That is not the intent of Paul, never was the intent of Paul, not the intent of the New Testament writers. They're talking about achieving righteousness through works, which you cannot do. But if you are righteous, you will have good works. You should. Anyway, you're, you were created, according to Ephesians, under good works through Christ Jesus. Amen? So when he's talking about, he's talking about the works of the law in relationship or in re, re, um, relevance to being saved by them. You don't get saved by the works. Amen. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now the him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to, te- but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man upon whom or unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You read these things, you know, Lord, you you just want to always keep stopping and running off. He's not imputing those sin to those who have received by faith the work of Jesus Christ. But you will have them imputed to you if you don't walk in faith. Amen? Amen? You know, at the day of judgment, you're going to be judged according to your works. You'll receive rewards or have lack thereof because of it. Blessed, you know, know, people come on and say, I'm saved, God's not imputing sin to me. That doesn't mean you can go out and sin. Because he's not imputing it to you. Remember we talked about last week how that those who who are doing those things are storing up wrath for the day of judgment. 
We don't want to store up wrath, do we? I don't. How about you? Okay. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was circumcised or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness was be, might be imputed unto them also. He received the seal of circumcision after he believed as an act of obedience to God. And everybody say, we have to obey. We were, the Bible... We need, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And we don't need to take it to a place that it didn't intend to go. And if we would live within the parameters of what the word says, within the context of what it says, how it was said, why it was said, to whom it was said, it would make walking with God a lot easier. <clears throat> and more accurate. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And so, he received, verse 12, and the father of circumcision to, the, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also that walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet been uncircumcised. For the promise that, should he be, that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, here we go. <coughs> the promise. God gave a promise. God always intended the promise to be received by faith. Even in the Old Covenant, the prophet said that God, you know, the just shall live by faith. Can you say glory? For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is in the law, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Notice he said that it is of faith that it might be by grace that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not the only which is of the law. That means he's, he's, he's talking here and saying whether you have the natural lineage of Abraham or, the spirit, or a spiritual lineage from Abraham, you are still going to receive this righteousness by faith. The righteousness was imputed. Now, the accuracy of some areas of some of the extreme teaching on grace is <clears throat> we don't earn our righteousness. Absolutely. You can't earn it. There's not, you can't do one gazillion Hail Marys, 14 billion uh, Our Fathers. You can't cut yourself, crawl up down the, the uh, abbey on your knees and cut yourself all up. You can, none of those things you can do will earn you righteousness. It is an act of faith in what God did in Jesus Christ, and he is in, once, we once we act in faith, we receive his grace of the imputing of righteousness or the declaration of our justification before him. Glory. And I'm glad I don't have to earn it. And I'm glad I don't, you know, I'm not required to earn it. <clears throat> when we take that position and go over here and start saying, well, I don't have to do anything that he tells us to do after we have received by faith through grace righteousness, we, we get into error. Notice, well, let me go, let's keep going. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope, believe in hope, that he might become the father not without natural hope. He had no reason to have hope. When you're 100 and your wife's 90, you have no reason to believe she's going to get pregnant. 
Because you've been buried a good number of years and she ain't got pregnant yet. There's really no reason to believe it now. Okay? Um, but who against hope, without any natural hope, believed in hope, what the hope of the promise of God. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. There was a hope that arose in his heart when God spoke. Even though there was no natural reason to believe it. There's no, there was nothing in the natural. That, you know, it wasn't like he was 25 and she was 24 and they just hadn't been able to get pregnant. We're 75 years down the road. All right, from there. He had no natural reason to be able to believe it. But he had a supernatural hope that arose because God spoke a word. Amen. And said, so shall thy seed be. Lost my place there, sorry. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. And we know from other translations that uh, it's a, it's a, Cat, you might want to see what's going on out there. All right. Huh? Okay. Being not weak in faith, and he considered not his own body. Now, by, now most translators say he considered his body. And when you try to understand what the translators are trying to do, they were trying to go and basically say that in considering their, his body, it didn't affect him. He didn't let it carry the weight or bear the weight of making his decision or creating his position of faith. Okay. So, um, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the front. That's what they were trying to get across. When God gave him a word, and even though nothing, about, nothing showed that that could happen, he didn't stagger at that word. Hallelujah. At the promise of God. Oh, thank God it was a promise from God. Through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded. That what he had promised, that is God, he was also able to perform. We need to become fully persuaded with God that whatever God promises us, he's able to perform. And let me say this. Not only are we to be persuaded that what he promises us, he's able to perform, he fully intends to perform it. That's why he promised it. God did not make a promise. He did not intend on bringing the pass. Okay? Okay? And there, therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness' sake. I mean, for righteousness. Not that it was written for his sake alone, but that it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, we also, who also are, de who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now here... We, now, we find out um, later that Abraham, now where do people get this idea we don't, we're not, we don't have to obey? Even after Abraham was declared righteous, even after Abraham tried to get God to, to accept uh, um, Eliezer, as his seed, even after Sarah laughed, and even after Isaac was born supernaturally, then God came and, and understand this, tested him with obedience. So take your son, thine only son, go into a place where I tell you, yonder where I will tell you, and offer him to me. Now those who teach that God does not Expect obedience out of us. I don't know why they think they think that. If Abraham is the father of our uh, father of our faith, and he is the example, the New Testament example of the life of faith, and of a righteous man walking out his righteousness by faith, why would we think that obedience is not part of the Christian walk? And the reason I say that somebody told me I don't have to obey, I don't have to submit, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to give. I don't have to submit. They just went on and listen. And I can go, I can go all over the New Testament and find a scripture that counteracts everything they said they didn't have to do. Okay? 
Yet God told Abraham to take Isaac up and offer him. And it was that act of obedience that brought the full force of the covenant for humanity into effect. Because you withheld not your son, your only son. And then Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Amen? I said amen. Glory. So we are justified by what? By faith. We receive the imputing of righteousness because of our faith. And we become righteous before God. <clears throat> Glory to God. Abraham gained a standing with God by faith that the, uh, many, most of the other Old Testament people never, never knew about. As a matter of fact, we all, he's the only one we have known that it was imputed to him for righteousness' sake. His faith caused him to receive a standing with God. And then in the New Testament, he's called the father of the <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Not sure what that's all about. Something about their tickling. However, after all of this, Abraham had to walk out his faith. He walked out his life of faith in a, as a righteous man, walked in obedience to God, did what God told him to do. Amen. Hallelujah. That was part of that walk. Chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we justified? By faith. Amen. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but all, we know that tribulations also, uh, we, we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when you were, that, were, you were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Thank God he did. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love, commanded, uh, commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more now, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I thought we were justified by faith. See, this is where if you jump off on one little thing and make it run off on a tangent, you can make up things that don't work. Well, we're only justified by his blood. Well, you're justified by faith, but you're also justified by the blood. See, got a whole, we had a whole one dominant. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tongue is just not working like it's connected to my head like it should. We have a whole denomination that took blood out of their hymnals. Said maybe the bloody religion. Well, you're justified by that blood. He just said it. It's the blood of Jesus that justified us. Amen. Through our act of faith, you, start, you just can't leave anything out. Glory to God. We also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we receive the atonement or really reconciliation. Atonement is not really a proper New Testament term. Because the atonement simply means to cover. We weren't, and that's Old Testament theology. They were covered and every year they had to go back and offer blood sacrifices again. Every year, every year, every year. To keep pushing off what? Remember we read the other day that God through his forbearance. And the word forbearance meant to put off. The, the implication in the Greek is this. It puts off the wrath of God in order to give you opportunity to repent. And the atonement every year. <coughs> that the Jews went through when they went in to offer their sacrifices, that atoning was to push, had the forbearance of God push it off for another year and push it off for another year. What? Until, until Messiah could come. Until Jesus would come. At that time, he would no longer, we would no longer be atoned for. He would take the handwriting according to Colossians chapter 2, he, I think verse 14, somewhere down there, he would take the handwriting of ordinances that were contrary to this, us and nail them to his cross. 
And we entered into a different theological uh, terminology of not atoning, covering, but redemption or reconciliation being purchased from and brought in and reconciled to the Father in what is referred to as the new birth. Glory to God. So the blood of Jesus no longer is acting only in forbearance, pushing off wrath, giving us an opportunity to repent. We're now purchased. Now, that, what's that scripture says? We are a royal priesthood, a, a chosen generation, uh, a peculiar people. The word peculiar in the Greek really is, is purchased. Better translated in modern language, purchased. We're a purchased people. Glory to God. You're purchased by God. Now, let me say something. All those who are looking for ways to keep living in sin under the guise of a teaching called grace. Now, that's not biblical grace. It's not even, it's not even true grace. I hate to even call it that because what the devil wants to do, he wants to hijack terms so that if you try to deal with it, you, people misunderstand what you're saying. The world does that all the time. You know, anti-abortion and pro-abortion. You know, now the terms are pro-life and, and pro-choice. The whole dynamic of women and, and, and society supporting killing babies in the womb happened when the liberal idiots of Planned Parenthood and their bunch changed the terminology to pro-choice and a man don't have a right to tell a woman what to do with her body. That's when it all took place. And the polls shifted drastically. Because they, they, they tapped into a thing in, in, in militant feminism. Not, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with being a, a, a good, uh, a strong woman who, who can, you know, can act and do and, you know, and not be some weenie beside her. She's supposed to be a helpmeet, not under his feet. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But the militant feminism, you know, men are evil and we don't need men and all that kind of stuff, you know, that, that whole revolution, you know, and uh, that tapped into that whole vein of men have no right to control my body. Well, you no, know, but you let him when you, when you had uh, uh, relations with him and got pregnant. Yeah. Hello? Amen. Well, you can't, that man can't tell me what to do with the, the, babe, the, the fetal tissue that's growing in my body. By changing the terms. Now, see, now, Satan does the same thing in the church. He'll hijack spiritual terms, and then when we try, we try to deal with it, everybody throws everything in there together and messes it all up. There is biblical grace. But I want, I want to say this. If you're, if you're righteous by faith in through God, through Christ Jesus, washed in his blood, <coughs> been made one with him through the blood of Jesus, why would you want to go out and do the things that you know displease him? Simply because you've been told he's not going to hold it against you. <coughs> it still displeases him. We read last week how the, there are certain things that were listed, and it's not the whole, uh, the whole sum of everything. But it says, for against these things cometh the wrath of God. That means it displeases him. Doesn't it? Why would we want to be doing things we know displeases our Father if, he's, if we are, love him? And appreciate the sacrifice that was made to redeem us and to reconcile us. Why would we go looking for ways to do things we know is, is, a, is a displeasure to him? And I bet you don't have a good answer for that. Now, if you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, and strength. What, <coughs> Jesus told one guy, he said, go sell everything you have, take up your cross, come follow me. Come follow me. Amen? Um, 4, verse 10. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 9. Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, here we were, the atonement or the reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God. We're not alienated from God. Wherefore, is by one man death 
uh, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 13, for unto the law, un, for unto the law was in the world, uh, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Now, don't run off and get too crazy about that. Remember, he goes back in chapters 1 and 2 and talks about that nature itself was a law unto them. Okay? Hallelujah. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them which that did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Adam committed high treason. Who is the figure of him that was to come? But not, all, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinneth, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now, Adam, one man passed death on everybody, but Jesus brought life to everybody. Amen? For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and all the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men the condemnation, even so, the, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came unto, upon all men through the justification of life. Now, now listen, I've had people take things like this, run off and start teaching that everybody's going to be saved. That's taking things out of their context. Now, let me say this. At the time Jesus was crucified, at the time Jesus was buried, at the time his judgment of God came on him for all mankind, he was, he was received up from the dead and, and, and delivered, for our uh, delivered for our justification, raised up from the dead. I'm sorry, delivered for our offenses, raised up for our justification, and then went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Everybody's name in the world was on the Lamb's book of life. How do you know that? Because the Bible tells us who we, whoever's name was not blotted out entered in. God's faith is everyone would be saved. He even put faith, action to his faith. But you know what? Man has a choice. You can reject what God's faith is and go to hell. There will be names that will be blotted out. That can't, can, I can't even fathom the people in hell knowing that their name was in the Lamb's Book of Life, but it's been redacted. It's been blotted out. And because of that, they can't enter in. It wasn't that they, that they would not be able to argue that their, that their acts weren't good enough to get them in heaven. And they did all these different things. Uh, I prophesy your name. I did this your name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They'll never be able to argue that God had set them up to fail in the first place. God had already planned on for them to come in. And because they didn't receive Jesus Christ as Lord, they got blotted out. That, that's, that's sad. You know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Know you not that as many of us were, and as many of us, I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped a whole chapter. I'm sorry. I jumped over to uh, chapter 6. <laughs> yeah. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In other words, the law came in to prove that you were sinful. That's okay, because where they were proven sinful, the grace of God was given to prove that you could have righteousness and provide the righteousness. That if sin has um, reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6, what shall we say then? Now here, see, you can't read chapter 5 and come up with a lot of teachings without getting to chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
See, Paul knew by the Holy Ghost that people were going to come right out and say, oh, if it's, if it's been imputed unto all, and it's under all, and it's forever, and all this kind of stuff, then we're all going to be saved. And he came right back and said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And it's rhetorical. it was a rhetorical question, because you should know the answer. God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And the Apostle Paul comes here and just slaps down about 95% of the excess in, in ex extreme teachings along the lines of what we call hyper grace, extreme grace. It's really not grace. It's, it's, it's a lie. It's, it's a doctrine of the devils. It's not a biblical doctrine to teach that you don't have to obey God and do what God says just because you're under grace. It's not biblical. And Paul even, re and Paul's referred to by many people as the preacher of grace. And he said, Can, shall we continue in sin so that this grace we're under abounds? And his response is, God forbid that. Don't think that because you're under grace, you can just go out and do anything you want to and it won't matter. God forbid. Here comes back to that point I made earlier. How should we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're in love with God, you're in love with Jesus Christ, you're thankful and grateful that he's redeemed you, how can you go live in that which he redeemed you for and paid the price he paid to get you out of? The price that was paid to get you out of sin, and I'm going to say this in a pretty strong term, how dare you go back and live in it and say it's okay with him? It's not okay with him. If Paul's writing by the inspiration of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost said, God forbid. Know ye not. There are term, there, there's ways that Paul speaks. And he he flips slots between two places all through his writings. One is what we, we refer to all the time as positional truth. That means it's who we are in Christ Jesus because we've been born in Christ Jesus. Now, the other terms, some people call it vital truth, applicable truth. I've heard it called several different things. But the other arena is Paul is talking about the application of that righteousness to how you live. And so one minute he might say, you're raised up with him, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And come right back down and say, now take off the old man and put on the new man. Don't yield your body as a servant of unrighteousness. Why? Because you've been made a servant of righteousness. So he, he's constantly in his writings, he's going between the two places. Why? A man's a spirit, has a soul, lives in a body. So the reality is, if you got born again and died instantly, we wouldn't have a lot of things. Paul, about half of what Paul said wouldn't be needed. Because you wouldn't be dealing with the body and the flesh and all that stuff. But you are. There's a part of man... Uh, really, two-thirds of man did not get regenerated at the new birth. The spirit of man did. You're told in Scripture to renew your mind to the Word of God. That's the second part of man. And then we're told that we got a promise of the redemption of our body in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're told to keep it under. You've got people taking the positional truth of their spirit and grace and then saying because of that position, their body could do anything it wants to do and it's irrelevant to them. You're walking in a dangerous place. You're bordering on Gnosticism that only the spiritual matters and material things don't matter. And that's just not true. Paul said that um, when we offer our bodies a living sacrifice before God, King James says reasonable service. The Greek says a, it is your spiritual service. You got to keep your body under. And that's why you hear somebody come on and do these teachings, and you'll say, well, that's all the scriptures. Yeah, but you got to go back to where Paul's put the other side out there and not get confused and act like, well, it just doesn't matter what I do with my body because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in grace and, and I'm, I'm planted with him and I'm raised up with him and I look like him and I'm the righteousness of God in him. Woo! And all those are true. But if you were all those things, then you take the power and the grace that God has given you in those positional truths and apply it to controlling your body 
and your tongue, renewing your mind so that you can please God with your whole body. Notice Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I pray God that he preserve your whole body, spirit, soul, and body blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter what you do with your body. God wants it blameless. Can somebody say amen? Okay. Therefore, I skip again. How should we live dead to sin, living any longer there? See, I'm dead to sin. I can't live there. No, Paul's saying, how, can, how should you who are dead live there? You can live there. But how in the world can you do that? With a good conscience. You can't. Knowing you not, know you not that many of us, as, as many of us, were baptized in the Jesus Christ, were baptized in his death. Listen to verse five, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> Knowing this, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having a little bit of a problem tonight for some reason. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now let me ask you something. Has your body been destroyed? What does that mean? He said that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You have, you, your old man is crucified, the, the spiritual man was crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You're going to have to take control of your body. And until it is destroyed or renewed or, you know, incorrupt, put on corruption, corruptible, incorruptible, you're going to have to deal with it. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the death, death no more, death hath no more dominion over him. And in that he died, he died into sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, here is the faith part. Listen to what Paul says. Now, Jesus died. His body was laid in the sepulcher. He was raised up from the dead, picked up his body. It's a glorified, immortal, incorruptible body. Hello? And Paul comes back here and after saying all this, he says, likewise, reckon ye also. Reckon. Your body is not incorruptible. Your body is not immortal. But by act of faith, you can reckon it that way. In other words, you take control and authority over it and tell it, as far as your appetites, you're dead. I reckon you dead. Amen. Also placed there again. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Verse 11. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, and that you should obey it in the lust thereof. There it is. Don't let it, don't let it rain. What? Why? Because you'll obey it in its lust. If you let sin reign in your body, you will obey it in its lust. Let not sin therefore um, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members. Now, everybody who goes around and tells you that it is okay, that doesn't matter if you're living in fornication or living in sin or you're doing this kind of thing, anybody that tells you that has violated this scripture. He says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Paul comes back again. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. This chapter was straightening out all the erroneous teachings going on in the church today. 
if they would just read this chapter and listen to it. Instead of going, well, I was walking through the house the other day and God told me. Well, can you find me a scripture that backs up what God told you? No. I mean, every time you turn around, well, I was, just, I was driving the car that God spoke to me. Let me say something. I just had a friend post on Facebook, and I had seen this about a year ago and um, saw some stuff about this. There's a new teaching going on in the church around the world that what God speaks to your spirit has more authority and is more important than what the written word says. And that whatever God speaks to you, we need to listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost because that's more, more important than what the Bible says. That the word, of God, that the word of God only refers to Jesus as the word of God. And, of course, my friend went on and just blasted that. I want to show you all the places that the Bible refers to the Bible as the word of God. Yeah. This is, listen, well, how can that happen? Well, it happens when preachers just stand up and say, God showed me, yes, yes. and he has no scripture to support it and substantiate it. Actually, what he teaches is contrary to what the scriptures say. In, in, in a way, anybody with good, with, with, a, with a minimal education could read chapter 6 and know that it does matter if you live in sin after you got saved. Well, what do you do if you sin? You repent. Simple. You repent. Why? Because God is, God is just. God is good. God doesn't want you to go to hell. And I'm not saying if you miss it one time, you're going to hell. But I'm saying you can't live there. You can't make a lifestyle out of it and think it's okay and go around and teach people it's okay. Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not <coughs> that to whom you yield your servants right, your, your, yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obe obedience. Yet. unto righteousness but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin but you have obeyed from listen don't take this out of context but you have obeyed from the heart the former doctrine with, which was delivered unto you being then made free from sin you became the servants of righteousness I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for as ye have yielded your members to servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and unto holiness let me say this he's telling them that he's already saying that you've already been met you've obeyed now, don't yield. He comes right back and says, don't yield your, your members as servants of unrighteousness, but yield them to righteousness. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, the weakness of your flesh. Your flesh will get you in trouble. For as you've yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, un, un, to iniquity, even so now. Did you notice it doesn't happen automatically? Paul's having to instruct them to do it. Even so, now yield your members as servants of righteousness unto holiness. Paul was instructed. See, if it happened automatically, he wouldn't have to instruct them to do it. Amen. When he writes to the church, <clears throat> and I believe, it's in, I believe it's in the book of Colossians, when he writes to the church and says, put off the old man and put on the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness, he's instructing them to do something to people who are already born again and under grace. But there is an instruction of things they need to do. It's not works of the flesh that's, that's getting you righteous. It is the works that are being produced out of righteousness as you obey the doctrine of the church, and I'm not talking about the, your, your denomination church, I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As you do what he said do through the, through the writings of his, the apostles, through the things he said in his teachings, amen, you, you, you yield yourself as a servant of righteousness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things wherever you are now ashamed? Now, again, why would you want to go back into stuff that you were ashamed of? 
and go. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's really a, it's a flesh teaching. It is a pandering to the flesh teaching that I can, it doesn't matter what I do with my body because I'm under grace. Paul said that when you are a servant of sin, you are ashamed of those things. Why would we teach people to go and re-engage in things they should be ashamed of? And I hate to say it, but that's about the bottom line to a lot of it. For the, listen, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, became servants of God, ye have the fruit unto holiness, unto everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're going to stop here tonight. Notice that as Paul is going through here, he's establishing positional truth but then he's also coming right back and saying, now don't think that because you've got this position in God that it advocates you from walking out the holiness of God, which is birthed out of the righteousness of God. You're not advocated from that responsibility as a believer. You are empowered to do it as a believer. The grace of God does not permit you to live Contrary to God's laws, his moral law, his Old Testament law, his New Testament law, the grace of God empowers you to live above and live out and establish the law. Thank God. His grace empowers you. Does it do it for you? That's it. People are always looking for the hungry jack doctrine. Hello, are you here? Take me, throw a little grace on me, throw a little blood on me, and I don't have to do anything else. It's all set up and done. You know, if you don't want to cook, if you don't want to do, homemade mashed potatoes take a little time. You got to go, you got to go wash the potatoes, you got to peel the potatoes, you got to cut them up, you got to boil them until they're done, you got to mash, you know, squash them or mash them. You got to add butter, salt, cream. Whip them up, glory to God. Some people take a blender and get them real whipped up, call them whipped potatoes. But let's face it, it's a whole lot easier to say one cup of water, half a cup of milk, salt, butter, and three cups of flakes. You know, five minutes you got potatoes. The other time it takes about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Fast food is designed for what? So you don't have to cook. Five minutes, we can be at Mickey D's or go through the drive-thru and be at half food. You cook the same, cook the same thing, better thing, but same meal at home, going to take you an hour, an hour and a half. We are conditioned to cater to the easiness of, to, to make it easy on the flesh. But walking with God, there are demands made from the word of God and he graces you, graces. He graces you with strengthening grace and empowering grace and even ability grace to do what he tells you to do. What they could not do in the Old Testament, we are graced to do in the New. But it's not automatic. You don't automatically do it. <clears throat> that is what the Old Testament Father, the Old Testament forefathers looked into. They saw the church by prophecy doing what the law commanded them to do and they could not do it because of the what? Weakness of sinful flesh. They saw a church walking by faith empowered by the grace of God to do what God commanded them to do. Grace is wonderful. But it's not, it's not a replacement for doing. It is the empowerment to do. Glory to God. I said glory to God. 
God says, I want you to go do this. I don't have to obey. I'm under grace. No. When I want you to go do this, a grace is available <coughs> to empower you to do what he said do. And if you're born of him, his spirit's in you, the life of God's in you, you should want to please him. Amen. You should desire to obey him. I'm telling you, I got my, my, our, our pastor, the church that we came out of. I didn't get to hear a sermon. I just got to see the little blurb he put out on, on his Facebook about this sermon. That, you know, do you love me? He's teaching, doing a sermon series on do you love me? And it struck me. Because, you know, we, we, you're in ministry. You say, well, you, you want to minister. You, you love people. You want to help them. But he said this. He said, if you, if you, if you, if you minister to people because you, you love them, they will hurt you and you will quit. But if you minister to people because you love Jesus, it doesn't matter what they do. Because you love him and you want to honor and obey and please him. So you're going to do what you're supposed to do no matter what the people do and how they treat you and what they say to you. He is why you're doing it. You love him. And as a believer, the grace of God empowers you to be obedient to God in doing what he told you to do because you want to do it because you love him. Amen. It is not a way for you to do what his word says displeases him and get away with it. Amen. His grace was sent that is your act of faith to receive his lordship. Remember what he said to Simon Peter? Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? He said, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said it three times. He, and each time he said this, he said, feed my sheep. He didn't say go feed the sheep because you love the sheep. He said go feed the sheep because you love me. And that's what I've required of you. Whatever God's required of you through his word, go do it because you love him. And his grace will empower you to do it. But it won't make you do it. Right. And that's where people get off. They get off on these places. And start teaching things that are out of line with the word of God. Because they're looking for a way to get away with stuff and still go to heaven. Don't forget, he is the one that said, come out from among them and be you holy even as I'm holy. And touch not the unclean thing. He did not say, I have grace to go hang out with those and just get, get, get filthy, dirty. It don't matter because I've covered you already. And no matter what you do, you don't even have to repent for it because you're already righteous. Woo! And people want to go to church and hear that. You're setting them up for failure. You're setting them up for failure. Hallelujah. Well, next week we'll pick up here in chapter 7, I believe we are. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.